Welcome to the Under the Hood Show. We are glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us, Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. What has caught your guys' attention? The fact that we are all together again. It's been a while, it feels we like. We get some consistency going here mm-hmm. with the whole team, and you've been under the weather a little bit, and then mm-hmm. I had traveled, and I think we'll get a, maybe a month in here before I have to go again. So mm-hmm. we're, Doug's back. We're on a roll. We got our you know producer Doug back in the in the studio. She can call and talk to Doug at 866-594-4150. So that, that's something I'm excited about. It has been a while. Actually, it hasn't. It's only been two weeks. But there was time I was out before that. And then it's just been a crazy, it's been a crazy month in my life and world. It has been interesting going here. What are you going to do, you know? Well, we're just happy to have you here. I'm That's glad to sure. be here. Yeah. 866-594-4150. I saw that uh, GM is doing another recall on tailgates. I saw the headline, didn't read the, the details yet. Electrical it, problem with them. On the, yeah, it's, they're sometimes going down inadvertently or unexpectedly. Yeah, the, there's so many recalls. I know last week we went through a bunch. Chris, we were like, we said we're not picking on Toyota because they're just one of so many out there with recalls. But they had thousands of mm-hmm. them, hundreds of thousands in a week, and they were separate, multiple things. But there's a lot of companies right now with with these things. But it never ceases to amaze us how there's a recall on one thing and not on another, or the same part is used over five years, but it's only recalled on one of those five years, even though we know for a fact, if we go into the parts counter, they're going to sell us this part that fits all five of these cars. But whatever that class action lawsuit was usually that. I'd like to find, we, maybe you have a contact that we can talk to that has been in the business, the manufacturing business long enough so we can have an honest comparison as to what recalls were like in 1992 and in 2024. Oh, I'd love to have that conversation because I doubt they were recalling cars because the fuel pump went out. Right. <laughs> no, but we were on the air in 1992 and before that, and you know, I can't remember when they, looking the, up uh, recalls. It sure, you my, 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 mem- my memory is that they were truly safety recalls, like your Windstar, right. where the axle beam was going to break and, and you could roll into the ditch. And right. no internet until, really, we didn't start looking up like automotive articles and stuff on the internet until probably like 1998, 99. And I, what made me think of it was just if you're if you were in it 30 years ago or 40 years ago, you didn't have the immediate way to contact people that you do, so you probably weighed differently whether you should do it. The government probably knew that that was true, so there wasn't as m- much pressure on you to do it. You but, didn't file your complaints on the internet Well, you either. didn't know, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, ah, my car is doing this, whatever. Who do I contact? Write a letter. Yeah. How do you do that? With a pen and paper to the NTSB. You see that every once in a while that the manufacturer had 12,000 contacts with someone with that problem or whatever it was mm-hmm. they didn't do that in 1980 no you know but they might have five really good ones right well <laughs> yeah and even that too yeah if 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 something bad happened in 1980 i would imagine and i'm not trying to say anything about the auto manufacturers but i would imagine they were able to wait it out a little longer than they are today yeah right sure, you know? for sure I mean, so i just it would be interesting to see what the actual difference has been over the years. 866-594-4150. We're going to start in Rhode Island today and talk to Gary. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Gary, what can we do for you? Oh, good morning. Hello. I've been listening to your show. Hello. Go ahead. Oh, I've been listening to your show for many years. And uh, I finally have a problem that I can't solve on my own. (laughs) And my convertible uh, T5, T7, or T5, T70, 2008 Volvo, I brought it in for uh, for the uh, company to look at the uh, hood because it 
I mean the uh, convertible top, because it would go halfway, would stop, and about 30 minutes later, if I turned off the ignition, went into the house for about a half hour and came back and turned it on again and pushed all the right buttons, the convertible top would finish going down. So I, I brought it to the dealership, and uh, they said that I need a new motor. Um, uh, about a year or two previous, I had a timing chain or timing belt put in, which was about 2000 And uh, so now they said it's going to cost about $5,000 to have that repaired. And, you know, it's a beautiful shape, uh, and I, I'm sort of don't know what to do. Well, I just feel for you, and I'm I'm happy they're well. Maybe their answer would have been better if they would have you would have came in and they said, "Gary, here's what we need you to do: plan ahead, look at the forecast." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I'm 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 guessing that's not the answer you were looking for. Um, right? Can you make it a manual? No. Yes. Yeah. Not, you say yes, but most people. What would you do then in that situation? Just disconnect the. Well, it's the soft. Well, it's the soft top. Well, let's go with this, Gary. No, been listening. No, no, it's the hard top. Okay. No, yeah. you can't make it a manual. Right. That, that's what I was thinking it was. Because yeah, Gary's been gotta... listening for years, and this is his first problem. He has not been able to. to I, I think this out. is. I think the solution is is that you need to go to another place to have it worked on, and or I, I shouldn't say that so quickly. The first pass, typically at a franchise dealership when they got the repair, is to sell their own products, and that is their. They're actually under some pressure. To do that, and maybe that is their only option. Exactly, and so it I is have, a Volvo dealership. Yeah, yeah and so. I, and I have seen many Volvo dealerships <laughs> that n- understand the perspective of their customer. That I've got a really nice car, and a 2008 Volvo is only worth a certain value, even though it's this nice hardtop retractable, and. They can't spend five thousand dollars to fix a. What would you say the value of your car is? I don't want to guess. What do you think the value of your car I, is? I would probably think ten thousand dollars. Yep, I, I was Russ and I. Russ was holding fingers. I think we're in the same ballpark. You, you just can't yeah. spend fifty percent of the value of the car to fix the convertible top. It doesn't make any sense. So in our right. area and other areas I know of, dealerships like that understand they need to give their customers options. But their first pass is seldom going to be that option. If they've got a good right. relationship, they may say, Hey, the new one's this much. I don't know if I can get one or else if I can, it's going to take a while or, or whatever it might have to be, but I can go. And I know there's a, a recycling facility I deal with. That's a certified auto recycler. And I've checked with them and they had a wrecked Volvo that got hit in the front end. There's nothing wrong with the convertible top mechanism. And they're willing to sell us that, that motor that you need for $750 and we're going to have five hours to install it at 125 bucks a piece for those hours or hundred whatever it might happen to be. I'm just throwing numbers around, but uh, right. you know, yeah, all right. this, all of a sudden you've got a repair that's a little more palatable. Um, but if right. they are, but if they aren't willing to do that, then you can go to probably, I would recommend like an automotive trim shop uh, if it was a soft top, but on a hard top like that, I think just a good general mechanic. Uh, it's, it's, it's movement, it's mechanics, it's hydraulics. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, I mean, they've probably got some limit switches and different things that are built into the system, but it should be rushed. Shouldn't that just be an, on- just a hydraulic pump, find it, find out where it's mounted, access it and replace no, they, it. Well, the, the Volvo dealership said they, it's the motor and that's what's so expensive. But yeah. The, the motor, motor the motor is basically a hydraulic yeah. pump. Yeah. They're, they're getting, they're getting way okay. too much for that motor for what the what the value of a car is when it gets older because the motor's still selling for the same price they didn't drop them yeah tremendously but you can put they don't fail very often so you can put a, a used part on there without a problem that's that's something i would definitely do i would not be thinking about a brand new expensive you know i if that was a right a ferrari i don't think if it was worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars still i don't think i'd still you got to think about the value of money do you really want to spend unless you got a lot of pocket change running around and you got a ferrari and yeah, you and say, they just said, fix yeah, it right, and they said the convertible right. top motor was ten thousand dollars but if i was you know trying to 
think, hey, I want to give that money away to somebody else that needs it. I'm going to fix my car and try to save money. I'd still be putting a used one on something like that. And if they're if they're not able to check or they don't do that sort of thing, your your friend is going to be car partcom on the internet. Our uh, partner, and someone they're, they're we a partner with. of ours, and recyclers from right. all around the country <laughs> list parts on there. Car partcom They're partners of ours in almost all aspects. Yeah, we sell on our- there, we buy <laughs> on there, we they, we promote them because it's a good service. What are the chances of finding? A Volvo S60 that is sitting there. Uh, very good. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Very, I, I think very good. The hardest thing is going to be just figuring out exactly where how to find the naming convention in the drop-down list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Gary, thanks very much for the good luck. Lo- uh, for the. Thanks very much for the call. I'm out of practice. Good luck. And thanks for listening all those years. 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. car feeling ill don't want to spread it to your wallet call the motor medics now for free advice 866-594-4150 that's the number to reach us here at the under the hood show let's talk to ryan you're on the under the hood show ryan what can we do for you hey guys so i'm looking to find a new shop to work on my 95 and paul ass and i'm wondering what are the right questions to ask to make sure that they're, you know, experienced with I have, older stuff like that. I have a question first, Ryan. Is it blue? No. Okay. I was parked. <laughs> I was driving next to one on the way to the show today. We stopped at the stoplight together. Since and I was you, wondering. Since you pre- preempted the call with the Berkeley Guess the Color of the Classic... Uh, nah, I, you're not doing this on a. I would not allow it for a '95 Impala. Oh, you I'm are sorry. so wrong again. Sir, Berkley sir, won classics so, would allow the car. You are so though. wrong again, Chris. <laughs> you are way right. out there. Right. Chris. I'm going right. to say it, it's it's got to be black. <laughs> I don't know. No, it's red. They made maroon black. That was real popular. Both of those, but it, I say black. What what color is this? It's black. Yeah, I don't even like black cars, but I'm, you got you got to get that car in black. I. That's what I think too. Okay, Chris, that you're wrong. Uh, all right, I'm gonna. Right. Just, I, usually, I, I'm a pretty pol- politically correct guy, and I'll just be smooth and not create a fight. But you're wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when you're out looking for a shop to work on these cars, it's going to be very specific because there's a lot of places that won't have a clue what to do. There's so many simple things on that car that are just like any any other car out there today that could be worked on brakes. Tires, struts. I mean, that's normal stuff. Yeah, sheer exhaust suspension system, from the seventies. Yep, exhaust <laughs> system's going to be the same. But when you get into the engine itself, if you're not going to do something simple like change spark plugs, change exhaust manifold gaskets, when we start getting into a little more things like towards the front of the engine or diagnostic abilities, the transmission's going to be exactly the same. But that Opti part spark distributor on there, the a lot of people that don't know much more other than to just bolt another one on and see if it fixed it, and maybe it will, maybe it won't. Could be something else. But if you don't have a problem with it, the rest of the car is pretty straightforward. Yeah. So you know, most shops will be able to do it. But if you find a shop, it's you're getting kind of a lot of the people that were around when that car was when that car was ten years old. That OptiSpark was in a lot of vehicles and was still really popular. So. Yeah. You know, we're talking about people that were working in shops back in 2005. That's 20 years ago. A lot of those people are dead. Not working in not shops working, in 2024. Retired, <laughs> you things like that. Dead. <laughs> yeah. When I, when I wasn't going to kill them yet. But. <laughs> you know, I look around at the shops and at and, and people, you yeah, know, when I, when I look at the average age at shops now, it's not people in their 50s, yeah, 50s and 50. 60s. Do they have somebody that has the ability to analyze pre-OBD2 data? Right. Well. Right. right, Russ? 95? Well, no, the that might be would, that might be an OBD2 car. I was thinking 96. Yeah, look at the no, connector it, underneath. It's, it's not? It's not? It's not. It's, o, it's OBD1. Okay, so if it's still a 1, then you're gonna. it's going to take a little more when you're diagnosing it. But it can be fixed. You know, a lot of these, a lot of these guys today that are working on cars that are in their 20s and early 30s are actually pretty good because they've with these cars we're seeing especially after during and after covid we saw a resurgence of classic car 
interest because people were working on them at home with their kids, with their friends. It was something they could do and they wanted to pick up something cheaper. So they'd go look for an older hot rod and something like this or a nineties Corvette with this LT motor in it. They would pick that up and they would try to hot rod at home and they would learn how these things work. They were simple to figure out, but it took some time. If you just take it into a shop today that has never worked on one and say, fix this, it's got no spark. They're going to go, Oh, whoa, whoa, okay. I'll, I'll look it up on your time and charge you while I figure it out. But, uh, yeah, you should be, you got to ask the questions. Do you guys, do you have employees in your shop right now that are familiar with the LT one cars, firebirds, Corvettes, Impalas that, that are still working there? Roadmasters. Yeah. Do you, do you have those, <laughs> those guys and cop cars and there's, mm-hmm. there, there are a lot of shops that just don't have that. And then there's some that do. So you'll have to look around. But if you need brake work, suspension work, go to the best brake and suspension shop in town, and they are going to nail that one because yep. it's it's stuff that's been around yep. forever. Uh, but inside the car, you've got yeah, a, you've got a mix of old school electronics trying to blend in with new st- new style electronics. Most everything is still a a uh, a twelve volt circuit through the whole car. There's no CAN bus network. Um, you know your your same problems that were happening in the seventies are going to happen in the in that car in electrical stuff inside the car. Um, there's nothing that's not Eat more easily testable and traceable with conventional electrical thoughts. Yeah. Versus having to integrate electrical thinking with network thinking. You get into the next generation of cars, then you had this weird conglomeration between electrical systems and CAN bus systems. And I watched Russ figure out a while ago one of them on a on a, a Denali suburban type vehicle that we helped someone convert from to a Duramax. And when it got down to it, it was over 10 years ago, yeah. like 15 years ago, but maybe. the vehicle was a conglomeration between early can bus system. Yeah. We had to get it to talk to each other and, and get these systems to talk to each other. And it was, it was interesting. I, I just remember the questions he was asking me, to, not that I needed to solve them. They were rhetorical. He was asking right. them out loud. I wasn't helping. The guy who bought that thing came into our shop a few weeks ago. Yeah. You were telling the, me that. Yeah, I, went, what? I know that vehicle. Ryan, uh, does that help you out there? Yep, I'm gonna. I was thinking I'll go to the local Chevy dealer. That's that's probably my best shot and seeing if they have any. Old uh, I, I I'm gonna no. disagree with that. I'd say no. Would they be able to tell them where to go? I hope they uh, would. They, well, they would be able to, but would they? And, yeah. and and I say that of any shop. When somebody comes into a shop and says, "Where can I go get my car fixed?" It's not you. Uh, there's a lot of shops out there are not going to say, but in our shop, if I don't want to work on something. Yeah, I'll give you a suggestion of where who might work on that kind of vehicle, but they're gonna, you know, a lot of shops want to keep it there, and and I don't know if a dealership is gonna say, oh yeah, this Joe's down the street, he works on those all the time, but they might. You know, we they, have just in all fairness, we both jumped on that pretty quick to say no. Yeah, you sure did. But we've just seen it too many times where that particular dealership doesn't have the technician that was working on those cars then. But if you're but, in a but, smaller town. Yeah, they're, they're, that's, Russ, you're hitting just yeah. where I'm going. Yep. If you're in the smaller town and you've got that dealership and you go in the back and it's the mechanic that's been there for 30 years and say, hey, you, I know Bill's in the back back there and he worked on these cars. Would he be the one working on this? Because, yeah, we'll have Bill work on the car. I can think of one yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, or that. Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of question you need to yep. ask. Because yeah. otherwise, they're going to get into one of the teams that have maybe a group of young technicians on it. They're smart enough to figure it out, but but they have to figure they have to it figure out. it out. Yeah, it's, and it's, you're going to be funding their education sometimes. And if, Doug, you can cut this right out of the national version. Uh, your shop would be able to do this for sure. Yeah, we we work on these. Yeah. I've I've worked on a dozen of them in the last couple of years. Ryan, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. And I would say. That uh, I was thinking, I was totally wrong. I was thinking of the next model or the next change of the Impala. I was thinking of like the 2000s. The, oh, yeah, yeah, that would be totally wrong. Dude, this yeah. car is, Ugh. yep, I'm with this you. This car was a unique uh, beast. I'm totally with you now. Yeah, that's not going to be a Berkeley Classics. Agreed. No Berkeley One Classic <laughs> See, for a I was newer right. Impala. <laughs> 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. Die-hard car geeks, we love you. Folks that know nothing about cars, 
We love you too. Under the Hood, America's favorite car talk show. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood show. Don't forget you can watch our show on YouTube. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel and join the Hoodie Fan Club at UnderTheHoodShow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Jerome Hybertson, congratulations from our friends over at Universal Technical Institute, UTI.edu. That's where you find them on the internet, and they will help you learn all about cars and motorcycle mechanics, marine mechanics, ATV mechanics, even aircraft mechanics now, CNC machining and welding. All sorts of trades that can help you to get a lucrative career and get yourself a jump start out in that market. They're they're trying to shift to unleaded fuel for general aviation, so they're going to need people that that, need to get in there, need to figure it out. They're trying to go with ethanol. They're doing a whole bunch of renewable fuel. First, they're just going with. uh, They just it's yeah. We'll see. You uh know you know what the number one concern is. What's that? Pilots don't want to crash. That's that's it. That's, that's it. always the number. They one. don't care what's in the tank as can long I, as it. Can I throw? Can I throw something else? Always out? catches on fire. I, I'm pretty sure the passengers don't either. Right. Yeah, true. Yeah. They, and it's like right put, now they're they're doing a test. They've got a twin engine plane, and in one they've redone the engines, and in one they're using leaded, and one they're using unleaded, and they're pulling them every time, and they're gonna make a worked on. They're not gonna rust out like a car because they're not. You don't have the salt on the right. ground and. Uh, don't need the NHOU for an airplane. Maybe and you to keep and the mice out. It might be made of canvas anyway. Exactly. So you won't, that won't rust. But they're, they're constant. Can you main, imagine, Chris, if you meticulously inspected your car? So every so many hours, we're going to tear it down, yeah. go through it, put it back together, and repair anything that's worn, and off you go. Boy, cars would just go and go and go. Let's talk to Steve. You're on the End of the Hood Show. Steve, what can we do for you? Well, uh, it's a classmate of mine's truck. It's an O2 F-150. Uh, he uh, had uh, the heater core flushed, thermostat replaced, and uh, and then everything flushed. He still has not got any heat. Uh, one hose is hot, and the other one isn't. And uh, his mechanic's telling him he needs a water pump. And he's questioning that. Well, why is one hose hot if a water pump's out? That makes me that makes me wonder. And is his engine's not overheating either, correct? No. Oh, it'd have no. to overheat if the water pump wasn't pumping water. As a, That's yeah. what he told him. And I, in yeah. the years in our shop, never once have we put a water pump on any of those F-150 engines because it failed. You have to corrode the blades off the end of the pump in order for it to not pump. We just never had that happen, mm-hmm. ever. We And we've had very few leak. They've well, Few have leaked, but very few. That's just something we really don't see much anymore on the newer trucks. The gaskets leak between the block and that. But the most common problem on a on a vehicle like that is going to be a plugged heater core. Now, you can take both the lines off that core, and you can shove a garden hose in one side of it and turn it on, and water may come blasting out the other side, and then you reverse it, and you get water out the other side, and then you try it, and nothing. You know, you're like, well, water goes through it. Why doesn't it heat? But if you went to our YouTube channel and looked at the video on why isn't my car as hot as it should be, we take a heater core, and we cut it up. We cut it in half and you can look inside of it and you can see the water goes in one hole, goes across the core in about six tubes and back out the other side. But the whole bottom of it, 90% of it is blocked. So 90% of it has just the air temp from outside going right through it, never changes heat, but that hot water is coming through the top, but it's so little of a flow that only one hose is, is hot up there. One's really hot. The other one, if you measure it with a temp gun, it would be hotter than the outside temperature, but it's much cooler. You just feel, you feel the hot one go, Whoa, that's hot. So when you put your hand on the other, it seems like it's super cold. You checked it with a temp gun, you'd see that, but likely it's going to be that the heater core is, is plugged up on that. We don't see a lot of the, we do see a few blend door motors that operate the door that stop working, 
So you could just unbolt the motor and turn the door by hand. And when you're turning it by hand, see if you get heat. If you don't, it, it just leaves the core. And, the, and if you really want to get down to it, just take both the heater hoses off, get yourself a clear piece of plastic hose, and jump between the two hoses and start it up. And if both hoses are hot now and you see coolant flowing, the water pump is just fine. That okay. clear hose is so much cheaper than a $400 or whatever water pump installed, you know. And you can't leave that, right? I mean, you wouldn't, that wouldn't be. Well, if you didn't no. want heat. If no, it no, leaked, I mean, the, I, I mean the, the hose. That's a, just to see it go through. Yeah, then just to, to see it going yeah. through. I mean, that would be a thing if it was pouring cooling on the floor so bad that you needed a core and couldn't afford it today, you could jump it with a regular My hose. 79 Trans Am in the garage has a heater core that the corner rotted out of it because it's real common on them. And so I have the lines routed so it doesn't go through the core. Gotcha. That was, I, I'm never going to need heat in that car. That right. was common like in 1982, 83. Yeah. We'd, we'd find them down in Texas that were rotted out. They'd get pine needles down through the vent, and then the core would rot. And it, yeah, they this, just, is, this is kind of crazy that it They did were it, leakers. But, yeah, there was just a bad solder joint in the corner of them or something. Yeah. Steve, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Is he going to be able to find a mechanic to work on an F-150? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> 866-594-4150. Let's go to Iowa and talk to Alan. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Alan, what can we do for you? Uh, thanks for taking my call. I have a 2016 Suburban, 5.3 with a push-button start. And uh, I have sometimes when I push the button to start, I hear a click in the, in the engine compartment. Just the check engine light comes on. Nothing else comes on. Uh, and then about five seconds later, I'll hear another uh, noise like something timed out. Uh, if I push the button again, then the dash lights come on like in the run mode, but nothing running. Push it again, and it goes off. Uh, so yeah, it's just and it's very intermittent, so I can't really get it into the mechanic and have them do some tests on it. That's the hardest part is when you when it won't do it constantly, and there's not a that's not a real common thing. It first thing I think of is that you've got a, a poor connection at a battery or the the main ground at some, some place in that system. And that's I've it. done a, a drop test between the, uh, the negative battery terminal and the engine block. Uh, and I get like 0. 0.13 volts. You've checked all those when it's not working, not when it is working. That's when you got to check it. So if you hit that button and everything's <laughs> dead inside, then you need to. I would go right out to the battery, and then I'd stick one into my leads right to the center of that battery positive post, not on the cable itself, but right at the post. And then I would go over to the fuse box where that power wire comes in, and I would check it there and see if I've got a loss. Because it, what might be happening is it's got some kind of a buildup going on in there, and it's losing connection, but it gets just enough power shannon just talked about this last week on the show you know you get just enough power on there that it arcs across whatever connection is weak and then it works and now you've got a connection the ground is usually not the one that fails on those vehicles it's usually on the hot side oh. but it could so be the hot on the battery on the battery and and the fuse box the big one that goes between the battery and the fuse box is where we typically find the the issue we've also seen some bad fuse boxes in those cars what you might try is if somebody's with you and you just happen to catch it at the right moment where you push the button and it's and it's dead, nothing but the check engine light, jump out real quick before you touch anything and have them stare at the dash while you open the hood and then just lightly touch wires. Don't shake everything around or you're going to go, ah, oh, darn, where did it go? Which one was it? But just, you know, lightly push on the end of each wire just a little bit here and there on that positive wire coming into the fuse box and see if you can get it to pop on. And then, you know, in somewhere in that area, tighten everything up, clean everything up that's right in that spot. And I, I've done that before where I've grabbed a hold of the harness and shook the whole harness. And I go, oh, great. Now, where was that break? <laughs> and I, but, but if, if it I, started uh, working, you probably, Chris is like, thanks, you fixed yeah, it. Fixed. For a short period. <laughs> sure. you know. Does that help you out there, Alan? No, I have a problem. I have a problem with the rear latch also. That mm -hmm. started. I don't know if it's connected to the uh, body control module. Or, it is. Uh, it's like I... I yeah. push the rear latch manual button. It doesn't do anything. Sometimes it does, but if it doesn't do anything, and I open a passenger door and I go back there, then it'll work. Yeah, and that's that. All all those things, even the starting issue, could all be related to the body control module. And we've put a number of body control modules in those vehicles. They've got to be programmed in the new part. And we've had 
you know, we've had some issues with them. So it's, you know, they, it could lead back to that. We first check all the wiring, try to verify that first, and then, then go after bigger parts. Alan, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Texas. Jason has an 09 Volvo. Jason, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Um, yeah. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Um, actually, it's a 2004 Volvo. Okay. Um, it's a V70R, and I really haven't looked at it too much. I'm hoping you guys could help me out quicker. Um, <laughs> so the suspension settings, it's default to comfort. I, it has three different settings, like push button up on the dashboard. It has comfort, sport, and advanced, and I can't get it to come out of comfort. What would be my best option on trying to figure that out? Well, if the if the system is has a fault in it, if it sees that it's got a fault code or it's got a, a problem with, it's going to stay right where it's at. You will not be able to change it. Let's say you've got a uh, a broken wire on one of the the actuators on the struts. It's it's not going to move. It's going to be stuck right where it's at. Or if the module itself has a problem, it's not going to move. So the first thing we see that's a foremost problem on on a lot of those cars is a broken wire i mean we've had them up for oil changes and we're looking around just kind of checking stuff over there say hey could you check my suspension it's doing something weird and we look oh look mouse chewed the end of that wire off or it's just broken off it's it's really it's really common I mean, we have we have a lot of people with suspension problems that that turns out to be a ride height sensor or a, a valve on one of the struts or something that's eaten off of there and i mean we just lots of different things where wires are are chewed and abraded by rodents and stuff like that that's where our we use our partner over at nh oil undercoating to help with that i mean when when we see a broken wire there's a it's a two-fold process fix the wire and then spray it with mouse out from nh oil undercoating because i don't want that same thing to be chewed again before we were working with them we had a car from our partner's radio station in Sioux Falls, and it, they, they came in, they ate the same wire three times, mm-hmm. the same wire, and they had to dig into the harness to get it. So whatever it was, the soybean oil and stuff it was made of, it just had that, that's what they went after. But it's, it's super common. I would say where you're at, Texas, I would, I would de- even in the city, I would definitely look for a, a wire that's been chewed or broken in that, suspension system first because you can do that at home right. and that's something you can repair yourself at home and then if that doesn't fix it then we unplug each one of those struts one at a time find out what the owner's manual says the resistance should be of that solenoid and we check it with just a cheap the repair manual probably yeah uh, cheap multimeter yep. and we look and say okay it's supposed to be four thousand ohms yep that's good four thousand ohms yep why is this one two yeah there's a problem with that one and go from there just one component at a time and in some of those systems, it can be as simple as a aftermarket set of wheels has been put on and there's no TPMS sensors and yep. it, it can't read the air pressure. So it says, oh, I'm staying here in Stay comfort right mode. here, yeah. That'll shut it down too. Jason, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Russ, Shannon, And what would they be without Chris? You're listening to Under the Hood with the Motor Medics. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. Let's go to North Carolina and talk to Rob. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Rob, what can we do for you? Hey, guys. uh, My brother's got a 2018 HRV EX um, and also want to make a comment on old airplanes too <laughs> he's got a windshield <laughs> he's got a windshield uh wiper issue um it's very intermittent it'll be in heavy rain light rain whatever short trips long trips and all of a sudden the windshield wipers stop so it's all over the internet uh dealers on the internet you know there's comments they don't know what the problem is or um uh, and I'm just wondering if you guys have run into this at all. We have not. We haven't had 
calls about it or emails or anything. This is the first one on that, but we have had a number of cars period over the years that have weird things with wipers. Like, Hey, my wipers only don't work when it's raining. It's like, well, how do you know when, when it's not? It's like, well, you know, if I turn my washers on, they work. Or if I turn on to get the frost off, they work. But when it starts raining, they just stop. And a lot of times what happens is the water goes down the windshield. And after it runs for a while, it gets into the wiper motor and it causes it to stop or just a load of them running for 10, 20, 30 minutes will cause the board to overheat inside and they'll quit there too. So have you heard, is there anything at all, any bulletins that the dealer had to give them any information about what they think it is, or they just know there's a problem and don't have any fix for it yet? Um, my brother called a dealer after I talked to him yesterday and there's no technical service bulletins on it. Um, if there's not yeah, none, the, you know, if you don't have yeah. any bulletins on it and we're not seeing them here, cause with our, with our show, you know, we're reaching over a half million people every week. And when something comes up, mm-hmm. that's pretty common on a car, it seems like I get at least a few emails here and there about it. Um, Mm-hmm. when when there's an issue like if somebody has a speedometer issue i i probably get 10 a week still on the chevys that have speedometer issues in them and other cars that have had fuel pumps and the ram trucks and all that kind of stuff i'm not getting anything on these so i would i would probably bet that you've got a, just a bad wiper motor that's a that's a likely possibility with what with what we know about those one thing you could do is locate the wiper motor under the hood there by the cowl where it's at and turn the wipers on. And of course you're going to have to keep them some water on them so they don't start dragging and give you the wiper police sound unless you can flip them up with the hood open, which could be difficult or just take the arms off, but run it when it stops. If you find that motor and then just tap on it, you know, if you got a small rubber mallet or just hit it with your hand and if it takes off again, that's a quick and easy fix diagnosis. So, put another one in if that's the case it'd be a bolt in in that car yeah okay yeah i told them to tap on it or maybe use a hammer but anyway yeah and, <laughs> yeah. If, and if the vehicle um, has any sort of a rain system, sensing system which i don't know that an hrv does th- that can cause another layer of sophistication to the issue but i i don't think that vehicle does nope rob thanks very much well, for he, the had a, he had an airplane oh yeah well, we can't airplane. miss that yeah, sorry go ahead rob yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I worked for a large textile company in South Carolina most of my uh, my whole career. Um, one of the products we sold in uh, my business unit was airplane skin. Mm-hmm. Sure. We called it. We sold it. Excuse me. Yeah. And we sold it to a one guy, the only guy in the market in California, <laughs> and it was basically very simple polyester fabric, but um, he would cut the rolls of fabric into kits, you know, by roll. Sure. And sell it individual kits with also what's called dope. Yep. In the old yeah. days, I'm sure it was it was a uh, high solvents, but of course today, probably, no, it wouldn't be. And um, and um, it was a good market for us. It was interesting that just one guy was doing it, and um, and uh, you know kept those. Of course, after you doped it, you could paint the plane and all that. And um, but that was help helping keep all those old planes uh, in the air, like like you were talking about. That's cool, Rob. Thanks very much for the call. Good luck. The uh, I'm thinking about doing that to the Pontiac. I'm just gonna do canvas and dope it. Yeah, I'm. I was reading an AOPA magazine the other day, so I think that's what I'm gonna go for. Put some nose art on it. <laughs> I got some ideas. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to William. You're on the Under the Hood Show. William, what can we do for you? Yeah, I'm looking for parts. I got a 67 uh, International uh, okay. pickup, 900B, and uh, someone put some aftermarket rims on there that are too wide for it, and they're rubbing the inside of the frame. And i just trying to find where I can get some um, factory uh, rims. Well, that is getting to be a, a vehicle that is growing in popularity and the collectability is, is going up. So you're starting to see more 
Facebook groups and people that are, and I know we have a guy right outside of Gerritsen that is international crazy uh, with tractors and more tractors and, and uh, die cast than anything, but he's got signs. He's got all you know kinds of stuff. He's got a couple vehicles, but um, there is definitely going to be some Facebook groups out there for that. Now you got to help me on this one and maybe Russ knows, but just what, what is the 900 B? I don't know the numbering very well. My, my brother-in-law would be able to talk shop with if he was sitting here. He's all over that stuff. That is but. the three-quarter ton, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it was international. It's one of their heavier yep. built pickup trucks. I can picture it. Because an international typically had the same eight lug wheels as it as a as a Mopar, as far as the big opening in the center that you needed, and you could yep. you, you could compare the the width of a of a of a Ram truck rim. Or I, I say Ram truck. It would have been a a Dodge truck back then, and they were similar and easier to find. And that was something that we always knew in our early salvage yard days is a lot of those would interchange. Now, if you're looking for the exact rim because they've got a certain clip on them or something to hold. Uh, I think that's narrow. Yeah, it's, it's going to have to be an international-only type of thing for sure. But I just can't believe there's not a Facebook group out there that would be all over anything you could imagine on these as that whole world is perme- permeated into the, the places to check. What size are the wheels? Uh, what kind of wheels they have on it? Yeah. Uh, they're aluminum rim, uh, pretty deep. They, I don't know what, um, uh, I can't remember the brand. But it's a 15 inch probably? Yeah. So it, like, it'd be a, like a 15 by six or a 15 by seven. Are you looking seven. on, are you looking on car dash part? Car dash part has a ton, a ton for that okay. year and make. So really? Yeah. A ton. I, that, that's awesome. Uh-huh. I, I, I was. It wasn't my first blush, but right? I, I didn't know if they'd have the model in there. And they've got them with side ring, without side ring. They've got all. Uh, there's well, many some, in some there. Some of those are probably split rims if they're saying side. That's ring. a Berkeley okay. One Classic. What color is it? Oh, I'm going, don't tell us. I'm going rusty red, like you know that faded like, out red. Red. I was thinking of your tow truck in your lot color. Yeah, yeah. Red. I was thinking the same thing. Well, I've got to go different. Then I'm going to say that this vehicle is a blue color. What color is the IH there, William? Uh, it's well, it's black and red. It's a uh, red, a uh, black stripe. Most of it's red. Okay. Factory color? Huh? Is that the factory color? Um, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, the correct answer, I yeah. bet. William, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. All right, we've got calls on the line. We're getting ready to take hour two. If you want to give us a call, eight six six five nine four. 4150. That'll do it for hour one. Brought to you by Sturdivance. All right, we're going to do this during the break. This is off the radio, but on YouTube. Let's talk to Gary. Gary, you have a unique problem. We got about two minutes we can give you right here. All right. What What can we I've, help you with? I've got, a, I've got a 1928 Whippet, and I'm looking for the emblem that goes on front of the radiator, and it's enamel, and it's about two inches around, and it's red, white, and blue, and it says Whippet right across the middle of it. That's probably not going to be a car dash part. I don't think that'll be a car dash yeah. part uh, solution. eBay, if yes. somebody has one, I've seen those. I've seen those logos around on for sale. I so would say it's going to be a collector's. A lot of people are collecting them, not even yeah. for the car. eBay, yeah. maybe Etsy. Are you uh, are you internet savvy? Are you eBay? Uh, not really, but I mean, I I do play on the internet. Okay. That's going to really be the only... I, I'm thinking eBay for that. Maybe Etsy or find someone who does so they just like don't 3D do a, printing. Right. Or and you might get it, something close. Because yeah. for, for Ford and Chevy and Dodge, you can buy those emblems still from Max and things like that that sell those. But mm-hmm. the Whippet is not going to be one with a lot of that type of parts. You're going to be able to find parts, but not those emblems. Right. A friend of mine, Jack, just recently surprised a young relative in their family and he actually commissioned a trophy company to make an emblem for him for an old AMC that the kid had. Interesting. And, and they it cost a little bit of money, but not crazy. But they with today's technologies with 3D printing and everything else, 
um, you know, they can take a design and make it a lot easier than they used to. Mm-hmm. And, but he, he, he hired a local trophy company. Now this was a more conventional emblem, but I was impressed how it turned out and he gave it to him for Christmas. And it was a big surprise because it was something they couldn't find anywhere. Gary, last word on this. We got to let you go here in a second. I'm looking at one right now on eBay for $125. So they are there. And that was just a quick search on Google. So you could go there. That's going to be really your, your only, or your best option is to just go try and find one and get it handled. Gary, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. You're listening to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show with the Motor Medics, Shannon Nordstrom and Russ the Super Tech Evans. Shannon is an ASE engine and parts specialist, and Russ is an ASE master certified technician with extensive factory drivability training. Join the Motor Medics for fun and free automotive advice with real world solutions to everyday automotive problems. The Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate. Participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go Under the Hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood show. We are glad to have you with us. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. Thanks for joining us Under the Hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. We've got uh, some folks who've been on hold for a while while the music played, so we're going to start right off by getting to the phones. We'll start here and say hi to Kurt. You're on the End of the Hood Show. Kurt, what can we do for you? Yeah, guys. Thanks for taking the call. Uh, 87 Ford. Uh, Bronco, Eddie Bauer, of course, full size. I think that's all they made that year. Uh, and rear window, uh, here's the deal. It's got the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, side, side out, uh, back door. You drop the window and open the door and it swings open. Uh, well, anyways, uh, the window is the problem. Uh, the front switch right by on the dash used to work up and down, not a problem. And then that kind of quit working a number of years ago. So you now in order to window up and down, you got to put the key in the back uh, and turn it left, right, and it'll go up or down. Well, it quit working with about four inches left to go to go all the way, uh, window all the way up. And that's where it stayed. And just kind of wondering uh, where would a guy, where would a guy start with that or where would I go with it? to get that window operational because you can't even open the back end up, of course, obviously, uh, without the window working. So, Yeah. Take the cover off back there. On the inside? Yeah. The metal cover, yeah. And then get yourself a, a voltmeter and stick the two leads in the, in the motor wires. Can There's, you get the cover off with the door shut? Yeah. Okay. Not very easily, but you can get, you okay. can get in there. It just, it's, pretty big goes around pull that off stick the two leads in the motor wiring and then stick that key in the door and turn it and if you get if it shows voltage with both wires in there both directions and one direction it says positive the other direction it says negative you just need to replace the motor it's that simple to start you know that'll get you back to where you were with the key working it and i'd guess the motors probably failed i saw a lot of those repair fail over the years and we've had to repair and put new motors in years ago we don't see them anymore i'm trying to remember russ and maybe i'm just getting scared from something that happened once but they're they're under is that under spring tension on that one well, when you pull the whole motor off, the window, yeah, that regulator is going to go. Thwing. Yeah, was, we had somebody get a finger pretty hurt. You'll lose on, a on, finger on, if on you're one not of those. Careful, yeah. And so the doors were that way on some of the Fords too. Yeah, so make sure you get doors. on and watch a YouTube video about the correct, safe way to replace replace the motor because it might be such a thing too to get 
the window down the rest of the way. You might just have to disconnect it and, and, and move it manually. But first, find out if the motor is right. bad. Because you know, Check that wiring. But if you find out you put the two wires in there and you turn it and nothing happens, or you put the probe in one side and then you ground the other one to the frame and you get power going one way and then you stick it in the other one and there's nothing, that means you've got a broken wire. Where is the broken wire? Well, it'll be in the gate. So you have to open it. And it's where the wires go well, through. Well, but he could, at that might, point, though, he can run power to the motor directly. And move it up Just and get down a battery and put some jumper open. wires and just be able to just jump right at the motor to get it down so you at least can get mm-hmm. it open to work on it the way you're supposed to. Is that how it's Because it's just a 12-volt electric motor back there, so you can just reverse polarity on that and, and run it up yep. or down. And it is a, a five-wire reverse polarity system like a power window, so if it works at the switch back there, but it does not work at the front switch, more than likely the front switch has gone bad because it's still keeping it to ground. So so the back one will operate it and let it go up and down. Uh, so you may need a switch up front and a motor in the back. But check the first place Are we start. Parts? Motor. They're available. Yeah. They're available. Oh, how about that switch in the front? That probably could be available too if you mm, dig around a little bit. Maybe. That's probably going to be one you're going to have to find used somewhere that somebody's got. If you're well, you could repl- you could put a different type of switch in there. If if you really needed to, you could leave that one in the dash and you could put a, a reverse position toggle switch under the dash so you didn't tear out the hole and have some ugly switch sticking out of there. Uh, and then you could just have it move it left and right straight up down under the dash. That's what I would do, and I'd leave the factory one plug in the hole so it didn't. Um, my my look hunch so is, weird. is that that vehicle once again we've talked about this before. They're part start- of the AC switch. Remember, Shannon? Yeah, they're starting to become more collectible, and because of that, the aftermarket may be starting to respond with some parts for this. But if not, you'll be out doing a a search on car dash part for like a temperature control, and then looking to see if they've got one that's been taken from another vehicle. It's like that 85 through 89 series in there somewhere, or whatever that was, or 90 even. But what year did they, yeah. 92, 92, it? they changed them again. With it goes the, all the way up the, to OJ Bronco. Yeah, and so 891, I just can't remember what year they, somewhere in there, I thought they quit making them, but I don't remember. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's uh, that's getting to be a, any of those, K5 Blazers, Broncos, Travel Alls, um, Scouts, uh, they're all just going crazy in value right now. So there's the aftermarket will respond because people are restoring them. Kurt, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. I had a conversation just the other day with someone about Eddie Bauer. They thought they, they thought Eddie Bauer made Ford Explorers. I mean, they had never didn't know it was a clothing, didn't know outfitter. it was clothing that, yeah, which is always, that was always a, I was always surprised when those were popular, still are popular, but back in the day, I was like, huh, that's a, it's kind of changed meanings over the years to a lot of people, for sure. 866-594-4150. Let's go back to Rhode Island. We'll go to Rhode Island and talk to Tim. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you, Tim? Good morning, guys. I have a 2008 Dodge Charger, the 3.5 liter engine in it. I have 282,000 miles on it right now. And I last changed the timing chain and water pump at right around 200,000. And you guys have made me nervous over the past few weeks um, talking about cars and timing belts going and blowing the engine up. Should I be replacing that now or should I wait until the 100,000 mile recommendation from Dodge? Well, the, the timing belts, the company that makes that timing belt is Gates in most cases. They make a lot of those rubber products and Pretty much all of the companies that are making those rubber products will say about five years, 60,000 miles is, is average what they recommend if you want the optimum, don't break, guarantee this thing's going to work. A lot of manufacturers throw the number out of 100,000, and one of the reasons is because if they said you need to change this thing every five years, people would say, that's crazy. Why do I want a car that I have to do that kind of maintenance and spend that kind of money every five years on? And a manufacturer doesn't have to warranty it past the three years, 36,000 or whatever warranty they put on it. There's some of them that'll cover the belt for three years, 36. They'll cover the engine for 100,000 miles or 10 years if the belt doesn't break and they consider the belt maintenance. So you've got to, you got to look into those things. So, you know, it's, I tell Chris, Chris, which car do you want to drive? The one that has the chain that 
you don't have to ever replace or the car that you got to put a belt on every five or six years. And he's like, Ugh, I'd buy the other one. And it's like, well, what if they told you the belt would last 20 years? Oh, I'd, I'd it'd be fine. And then it breaks at three years. Oh, I'd be bummed. <laughs> so there, there are, we're, we're seeing this. One of the things we're seeing it common with is the Ford Escape. You know, that's one where the belts changed at a higher interval, but we've seen a number of them at, at least six of them in our own shop that have broken at around 75 to 80,000 miles. What years for us? 2019s. Gosh, and 2020. It had not hit my radar that that's still a belt. Yeah. So it's, it's early. And it's uh, that little turbo engine. It's a it's a early, or, or it's not very old, and they've got a belt, and they break, and they're early in their life still. But you know, you look at a car that's it's five years old, and it's got you know eighty five thousand miles on it or so, eighty thousand. The belt breaks on it. Well, it's not a recommendation yet, but it's still broken. So, not everyone will do that, but they can. So we it, it, personally, we like to see those. If I was driving that car, I'd be changing that belt earlier or at least inspecting right, it really closely that's the weekend project this weekend so then that <laughs> brings me to the second question which is my 2004 ram 1500 and i have 202,000 miles on that but that's going to change and it's got the original chain in it so are you worried about that or just let that let that be we have not had problems with timing chains on those ram engines on the five sevens uh six twos we really haven't had a problem until we hear noise out of one. If you get to a point where you've got a noisy chain and it's still running good, then you might want to think about changing it. But the good thing about a chain is you'll start to get a little noise and a rattle, and maybe it needs tensioners and a chain, whereas a belt works perfectly until the day it does not. <laughs> right. It's working now, and two seconds later, it's off the car and your motor is gone. That's that's the difference between those two, which is is great. So if you got a chain, I would say no. I if as long as it's not making any noise, I wouldn't be concerned with it if it was my own car. Tim, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood show. If car repair was cheap, you wouldn't need us. We're Under the Hood. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. Let's go to Nebraska and talk to Charlie. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Charlie, what can we do for you? Well, we've got a 1990 Ford Ranger with a 2.9 liter, and uh, it would lose spark, and we pulled a spout connector, and it, it would spark again. And I put a Napa computer in it, and uh, it just... It ran good for about a day or two, and then it quit, and that's never run again. And I'm just wondering if we've got a better replacement for this computer. Yeah, when you pull the spout connector, the spark output timing control wire, for the people who don't know what a spout wire is. And thank, thank you, Russ. <laughs> if you if you pull that out, it allows the the vehicle to run just off the distributor and module in order to fire the spark. So the computer is not controlling it. But if the computer shorts and that wire grounds, you got two things going on there. Either the computer has failed and bad and it's causing it to not spark or the wire between the distributor under the hood and inside the computer is compromised somewhere. It's been chewed. It's shorted to ground. Um, uh, that's possible. There's, there's possible. Okay. There's a break in it on, on that vehicle. And, and one thing we have even done, you know, I don't think we've worked on one with a spout problem for probably 10, 15 years, but at, at a time I had cut it loose under the hood and run the wire through the outside around the door and cooked it right at the computer just to see if it fixed it. And I had one that did fix it that way. So we ran another wire. Oh, inside the car left it there now nah, we we <laughs> ran another one inside just because we knew that you know hey it's an older car we can not. do this for 50 bucks or yeah. <laughs> or we can find out where the brake is and hopefully you don't have yeah. more wires broken but if you can't see it then it yeah it could just be compromised where it goes through the wall or something up then they're broken and it all and has you're to saying do the wire between the distributor and the computer uh, engine control module Yep that that's where that that's where that spout runs. So you gotta you gotta okay. follow that. But if you just disconnect okay. it and run it all the way to the computer, so it can control it, that could be okay. what's what's going on. But it, you know, it's a possibility that computer failed. But mm -hmm. if if the reason the computer failed 
is is it worked great with the injection, but it's just killing that spark output wire. And then you mm-hmm. replaced it with another aftermarket computer, and the exact same thing happened. A shorted spout wire is like the last thing that ever fails in a in a Ford computer like that. So it'd be super rare for that to happen. So I'm thinking that both computers are probably good, and you probably got a shorted wire somewhere. Okay, but yeah. it's possible. Just when we think that, it's probably a computer, but mm-hmm. it's very okay. it's it's the most unlikely scenario. Okay, well I'll look at a diagram and follow the spout wire back to the computer and maybe try and replace it and see what happens. Charlie, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Eight six six five nine four four one five zero. Headed to Michigan now to talk to Gary. You're on the End of the Hood Show. Gary, what can we do for you? Hey, good morning, guys. I'm, I'm the famous guy with the 59 Chevy El Camino. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You guys talked to you guys a couple times about it. I had a problem with it uh, for the first time ever. I've owned this truck now for about 20 years. Uh, back in August, I was heading to my, my last car show of the season. I got about a couple of miles away from it, and all of a sudden, I saw steam coming out of the hood, and I'm going, Something's wrong here, obviously. I went down and looked at my gauge. It had pegged and uh, got to, ended, up, ended up doing a little prayer because I was in the middle of nowhere. Got to the show, shut the thing off, let it sit all day long. Ended up uh, checking it later later in the day after everything had cooled off. The radiator was pretty much dry. I talked to a couple of my mechanic friends out there. They said I might have had a stuck thermostat. Uh, it might have been a small leak in the water pump. I don't know. Uh, I filled it up with coolant, with water when I was out there. My wife met me out there, and we filled everything up, drove it home, uh, probably about a half an hour. Uh, the temperature was normal. Uh, there was plenty of water left in it when I got home, and I let it dry, you know, cool off, obviously. But uh, it, it still the coolant looks a little, a little funky. And I'm going to take it out to my mechanic before we get started in spring. I'm just wondering, uh, first of all, what do you guys think? Do you think it might have been a, a small leak in a water pump? I couldn't see any leakage at all, or maybe a stuck thermostat. And I'm going to change. I want to change obviously the thermostat out, plus the entire cooling system. But should I use? Would you recommend something like uh, Evans or Redline with Super Cool or something to to keep the temperature down? And also, should I use distilled water in it? Distilled water, a hundred percent, with whatever coolant you're using. If you're okay. going to mix your own coolant, but as far as the coolant goes in that type of car is it's all factory under there basically, right? You don't have a really, yes. okay, good. If it's all factory in there, I would recommend the peak pre-mixed coolant for the engine, because then you don't have to worry about distilled water. You can use the extended life or the original conventional green antifreeze in that vehicle either one of them would be just fine but use a pre-mixed 50 50 coolant that way it contains the water you need if you and that's what i'm using in my old model t if you okay. pre-mix it you run the risk of not getting the ratios right it's a big pain in the butt because you got to get you know mix this and mix if that you mix it yourself water. you're saying. right and then you got to buy distilled water but the peak coolant is going to contain water that doesn't have the uh, the minerals and things in it which will cause rust and it also has rust inhibitors in it so it'll keep the cooling system oh. cleaner so i would drain it flush it out really good and make sure it's i mean make sure that thing's it's empty you might even have to use a little yep. bit of coolant in there to get it flush but um, we like to flush it with the coolant to make sure we don't have water trapped in passages in there that could cause rust later but get it all flushed Makes out sense. Put a new thermostat in it because, yes, that old-style thermostat could stick, and when they would break, they would break in the closed position and overheat. So our partner, Motorrad, when we talk about them and their cooling systems and their closure caps and stuff, their thermostat, when they're designed so that when they break, they if they break, which is going to be rare, but it's going to stay open instead of closed. So if you have a thermostat break, you want it to break and open up all the way and go, oh, hey, my car's just not getting as warm as it should rather than overheating and boiling. (laughs) So Motorrad thermostat, put the peak antifreeze in it, the coolant. and Okay, where where would I find the Motorrad? You can get that at pretty much any auto parts store. They're going to be found all over. I'm just not familiar with that brand. Yes, it's, it's, it's been around forever, and I bet if you start thinking about it, 
when you when you start looking and you see caps, you see radiator caps, you see fuel caps, you're going to go, I've seen those before on the shelf, the Motorrad caps. They're very, they're they're famous. They've been around for a long time. Um, and the, as well as the thermostats as, as well. But now I would also put a radiator cap, a brand new, put a motor red cap on that. And the reason you're going to put a cap on that is because I'm guessing that car doesn't, it, it doesn't have an overflow tank on it, does it? Does it have some kind of a, just a catch no. bottle on it? No, it doesn't have anything on it. It's okay. A, it's, a, it's a small block that was in, in the truck when I bought it 20 years ago. Yep. So it's, It'll push, if you get it too full, it'll push coolant out onto the ground. And then if you've got a bad cap, it's going to pull air back in and you can keep doing that and you can lose quite a bit. I would suggest if you can find something, and and you can, but if you can find something to go under the hood that uh, they might have had a dealer installed overflow tank, or you can even come up with your own. A lot of people had glass jars, like the old ball jars, but longer, bigger ones. Get something mounted under the hood so it looks period correct for that car that will be as high as it can be on the radiator and hold coolant. So when the car gets hot and pushes coolant out, it'll fill up the jar. When it cools off, it'll pull it back in. And that way you can keep the the radiator because you'll lose a good two inches of cooling at the top of that radiator because when it gets hot, it'll be, it'll be right up at the top. It'll start pushing it out. And then when it drops down, cools off, it sucks air back in. So if you can get an overflow coolant reservoir tank on there, it's going to make a difference in your in your cooling system. Gary, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. And since Gary has called before, I will assume we have asked the question on the color. We have. I can't remember what and it was. I, what color was your car, yep. Gary? It, it, it's two-toned, regal turquoise metallic and, and a creamy white. Yeah, I, I think we've asked. Fact, factory color. Uh-huh. Yeah. And it, I would suggest, too, when you put that back together, um, if it is a little leak here and there, make sure and use some K-Seal in there. It's another one of our partners, but in, in that age of vehicle, if you don't want to open that thing up and reseal everything, it's a great, great tool. We're going to take a break. Before we do, is there any other partners you want to talk I about? I know that, was, that was partner heavy, but it, was, it's, it's what he needed. Chris, you're Gary, our partner. Gary, he was like a plant. We just solved his problem through capitalism. Good luck, Gary. <laughs> You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. YouTube certified mechanic. Yeah, that's not quite what they mean by certified mechanic. This is Under the Hood. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here at the Under the Hood Show. Don't forget you can watch the show on our YouTube channel. And if you subscribe to it and join the Hoodie Fan Club at UnderTheHoodShow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Lisa Beard, congratulations from all of us here at the Under the Hood Show and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. Find them at uti.edu. 866-594-4150. Let's go to North Dakota and talk to Brian. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Brian, what can we do for you? Hey, guys. Um, thanks for taking my call. Um, got a uh, 2010 Cadillac PTS Sport Wagon with a 3.6. Um, I picked it up from a auction. It's a salvage vehicle. Uh, it was salvaged for hail. Um, when I got the car, uh, it didn't have keys, uh, so I didn't know if it ran or anything like that. Uh, get ended up getting the key made. Uh, would not crank. Would not crank. Okay, great. Uh, Pull the battery out, charge up the battery. Uh, now it's uh, cranking over really, really slow. However, I pulled the codes off of it, and I got a P0008, the engine position system bank one, and the P0017, uh, the crankshaft, or crankshaft position code. Um, and lo- looking those up, it's that uh, the, everything's, point to a timing chain it'll crank but it it just sounds like it's a, almost a dead battery instead of uh um uh, you know something with the timing system uh, i'm not knowing much into the car um i you know i got it for enough where i could just walk away from it but uh you know i'm just wondering whether or not it's trying to i don't really want to do a timing chain on this car it's really not worth it if it's if that's what i'm thinking it is well, I'm going to just throw out a little something that might be just interesting to hoodies listening. 
and it drives me a little bit bonkers. We are in this business of buying insurance salvage and dismantling it for parts. We also, through the years, have bought plenty of insurance salvage that is very repairable for someone else that's not going to be doing it at, at full list price rates, and they're able to fix that vehicle up as a repairable salvage title and, and enjoy the vehicle for a lot of years. So I've seen, all of a sudden, I'm kind of getting to be the old guy that's seen a lot of stuff for 30 years plus. And one thing that drives me bonkers is when you've got a vehicle that's middle age, I'm going to call that a middle age car, um, and it has hail damage or a fire. <laughs> and then when you get it, you're kind of hedging your bet because you're wondering why would they let that car go and not just take the money for the hail and keep driving it. If the car was okay, the sport wagon's a cool vehicle. Um, they're kind of a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a cult falling. Sure. Form. Yeah. And I could see that somebody said, Oh, my baby's been hurt. I got to get rid of it. I don't like it anymore. It's got damage. I just, I can't have this anymore. But I could make that decision based probably on the condition of the vehicle. If the vehicle was a little rough around the edges, had some miles on it, and then it got hail and became a salvage claim and they let it go, it would amaze me that there's not something wrong with that vehicle. And that's an opportunist, opportunistic hailstorm that they happened to get into. And they said, you know what? <laughs> um, yep, it got hailed on and we're going to take our claim. It was it happened to be sitting outside that night when the hailstorm went through. <laughs> And so I'm always skeptical about that. It, it happens just enough that I'm always watching out for it. And, when, when our, that's, and I've trained our buyers the same way. It was, it was one of the things over the years that we've trained Chad and others. You can't today. start it, don't buy it. Yeah, so when you go to these auctions also, you buy it like on a, like on a Copart or an IAA auction type of place? Yeah, it was a Copart. I, had, I picked up a couple other vehicles that were same similar like what you described, but through hail damage and stuff like that. What, and, and I, you know, good luck on those ones. Yeah, uh, no, no. Know, I mean, it's, I, I said the, the losses are way fewer than the wins, but, um, when you have something like that, I, I'm going to guess that somebody had a, a known problem, hail came and they were like, okay, yeah, well, yep. let's, let's, okay. let's figure out a value here and we'll take a claim. And just so happened that the keys aren't around. I don't know where I must've lost them. Sorry. Geez. I don't know where they're at. I can't find them. You know, so, um, that, yeah. I, I hate it. And if it's somebody's car out there and that wasn't the case, I'm very sorry. But with the history no. of timing chain problems at the three, six engines in that era, it does not surprise me. But you could put chains in it. You know, that's as long as the valves aren't bent in that car, we've seen them. We've seen some of those almost 90 degrees out in the Cadillacs and we've, we fixed them. Well, all the three, six, it's the same engine. Basically yeah, that's, that's all got the same timing, but you know, you got to pull the engine out to do that. And on some of them, the ones that are, are forward facing that are rear wheel drive, you can pull the cover off the front and do it in the car, but you take it apart, you line everything up, put chains on it and tensioners and put her back together and fire her up and you got a good car. Is there a good, any good way that he can check without retiming it? Um, the valves, I mean, is, is, can he, not unless he pulls the camshafts out. Yeah. So they're not holding the valves open. Yeah. Just trying to see if there's any way he could know ahead of time, whether you take he's, every, you take every rocker off. So you are every, well, you could do that, but you know, take, take the cams loose, take all the, 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 uh, caps all loose. So you can lift the cams, pick the cams up. Then you can check the compression, you know, check leak down on them, not compression, but apply pressure in there to see if, if any of the head, head, heads of the valves got bent and then you could take a bore scope and look in and see if there's any cylinders with but that's, marks on top that's of them. pretty rare we've it had is. very few with bent valves in them usually it's just out of time and we time them we've had some of them that don't even run anymore they're out of time so bad and and we've timed them and put chains in them and they've been good to go again and once the chains are done then they're good for another hundred and fifty thousand. because what we've done a lot of times when people need a motor and we've got one that we know that runs good and it's got 150,000 miles on it, and we can kind of tell by looking at it, it hasn't been opened up yet, we'll just say, hey, buy this motor while it's on the bench, put, put all your timing set in it, and then put it in the car. And Because uh, if you put it in there 150,000, you're, you're playing some pretty good odds that you could have a problem. You're going to be doing it yeah. soon. We do a lot of chains on those used engines when we put them in. We just want to make sure they're done that in the Colorado engines. Does that help you? In. Oh yeah, it, it definitely does. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's 180,000 miles on the car, some rust and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, with the hail damage, you know, I, I, some decision to make whether or not I want to 
you know, spend the four, five, three to five hundred dollars on the timing set chain, and then the labor doing the labor myself. But I mean, it's something that definitely could be done. Well, if you make the car uh, run and know, drive, I'm glad it, to hear that it's a. I just gonna say, if you make the car run and drivable, and you clean it up, and it looks good, somebody will buy it. But it, as a as a scrap car with a bad motor, uh, it's still it's just not going to bring a a bunch of money. It's going to bring more than an average scrap car because it's got some unique parts on it. But it's also not a high demand right. parts car. So you're kind of caught in a trap there on that one. Sure, sure. But I definitely, I mean, that's that definitely good uh, advice on make sure you're, if you're buying it from uh, from Copart or whatever vehicle auctions, it definitely to uh, make sure it runs beforehand and, and not buy the ones that are not running. Well, and you got people too that will buy in one place, find out they have a problem, and then they'll shift it to another place. So you got to right. really watch for that too. And it's hard to know sometimes. Brian, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Kevin. You're on the end of the hood show. Kevin, what can we do for you? Hello. Hi hey, there. I got a 2009. I got a 2019 Rubicon two door with a two old turbo e torque engine. Now my question is, uh, I got a battery ma- maintainer on the 12 volt. Does that bleed over and charge up that 48 volt system? No. That is a good question. Yeah, no, that, that won't charge it, but that one shouldn't discharge. It'll be a, take a long time for that to, to discharge. Plus it'll recharge itself once it, once it starts up and you get it going again. But the, the one that dies the most often is going to be the small 12 volt battery in there. Um, I just, I, I don't have that. What's that? Oh yeah. A regular battery. He means. I mean the regular battery. Yep. That's what I got the maintainer. Yeah, yeah the exactly. No, that's the one that fails the most and you're doing the right thing having the maintainer. I think we're all yeah. talking the same language. Yep. yep. Yeah. It's the big, the big battery though. The 40, 48 volt system in that you won't be able to, to charge with a main and a the, maintainer. That is a very rare, I mean, unless you long, find a maintainer for that. I mean, there are bigger maintainers out there, but it's not common to buy. But it would also right. not be common for that not to just be able to charge itself again once you get going. Right. You just right. won't, you just wouldn't have the e-assist right away. Right. Yeah. Is there, that's, is that even a thing that people think about the 48 volt going dead? Not really. Right. No, even, but if you let it sit it. long enough, it can, it can go dead. I, I've seen them, you know, if they sit for four or five months, they'll, they'll go dead and then they won't, they won't start the the vehicle, you know, unless you've got a vehicle, some of those have a regular starter plus the start stop starter on it, which is spinning the, spinning the engine with the big battery. And then that'll allow it to start. I don't know know how that system is on that. I drove one of those once and I was extremely impressed with the power that produced. Mm -hmm. Oh, you've got that right. (laughs) I, I, I drove it and I was like, huh, what is this? And then they told me it was a two liter e torque. I'm like, huh, this feels... It was. It felt way peppier than the three point six. That's when my wife and I were shopping for Jeeps back back then, and it definitely felt way peppier. We thought than the uh, than the three point six. Does that ease your mind, there, Kevin? Yes, it does. And one other question, quick: Does it have a timing belt or chain in that? I should have a chain in it, if I remember right. I'd have to look for sure. I'd want to verify, but I think it's a chain also. Kevin, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. If your Band-Aid can is empty because you have so many dash lights on, you need to call Under the Hood. 866-594-4150. That's the number to reach us here. At the Under the Hood Show, let's go to Mississippi and talk to Johnny. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Johnny, what can we do for you? Yes, sir. I called you back in December. I got a 2000 F357.3. Okay. And I've rebuilt it all together, seem like. You had done a lot to that, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, but I've done even more now. <laughs> <laughs> the checkbook is smaller. <laughs> It's smaller, but I want to know about it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So the thing about it, and I'll just tell you some of the things I did to it, and maybe you can help me out. What happened? I was just at a store. It just cut off. Okay. I had it towed home. 
And I figured it may have been the camshaft or something. So I put a camshaft sensor in it. Still wouldn't start. I went on, I put IPR in it. Still wouldn't start. I came up and put ICP in it. Still wouldn't start. But I noticed I wasn't getting fuel to the fuel bowl. So I checked it and I put a lift pump or fuel pump on the rail. And it still wasn't coming up, but it was Googling. So I went and pulled a tank off it and put a new sending unit in it. And all my fuse is good. Uh, I guess the relay is good. I don't know how to check them. But uh, everything, all my dash lights and everything worked, but it just, it'll turn over, but it won't start. And it's really, I've talked to a lot of people and nobody know what the cause is. And I was just wondering, do I, what else do I need to do? Or what else possible can I do to try to find out? I had a guy come out and put his read on it. He was a, a service tech and he couldn't get a read. Now, when I take, according to the way I read it, if you take the, pull the pigtail on the ICP, it should default the ICP to 700 or something, and it still should run. But I pull it off, and that's the only time I ever get an engine light. Now, when I first try to start it, I get an engine light and a wait to start signal. So that's where I am. Well, I'm concerned about it not having fuel up in that filter bowl. Is it still doing that? You where you get don't have it completely full? No, sir. It's not still doing that. It was coming through, and I didn't mention this, but I just ordered a oil. Well, I received it yesterday. A oil, a water oil filter that go on the frame rail between okay. the pump and the tank. Okay, now that. I had never changed that. I've been had this truck since it was new, and I had never changed it. All I did was sort of drain the water, you know, just drain yeah. it to see if the water was in it. Well, when I took it off the other day, it was just gummed up. I mean, you know, I guess through the 25 years, it had, uh, you know, because I didn't know that it needed to be changed because I've been trying to learn it through the years. But anyway. That's why I am. Yeah, that's definitely got to. That's definitely got to be changed. It can cause some problems. You'll get trash that'll come past that and get all the way up into the engine. You can have problems in the in the pump or get injectors gummed up. Uh, I wonder how many people listening are like me who can. F- I I felt as you were talking about what you did, my anxiety was going higher and higher until he said he's owned it since new, and then I was kind of like, oh, I see now, because I. I thought for a minute there, I was just thinking, this guy's crazy. But then. <laughs> Spending all the money on a used truck yeah. that he just bought. But when he said that, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. I get it. Yeah, you want to. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> well, the, the first place we got to do is we got to start with fuel. Is that fuel getting all the way up to the top of the engine, past all the filters and everything, 100% clear and clean, no air in it? Because if it's got any in it, it's just not going to run. And that's that's where we first first start we go up to that last fuel filter up there and the the hose coming out of it and make sure that that is 100 percent clear and pressurized and you've got it you know your lift pumps pushing it up there without any air in it and start with that and then uh, and then go from there i mean if, if have you you said you replaced the i think you told us before you replaced the valve cover gaskets with the wiring harnesses up there so your glow plugs and injectors and everything got good power has that been done no, sir, I haven't uh, done that. Because they break down. That's a huge problem on those trucks where that harness goes through the top of that valve cover. They break down at that connector there, and then your injectors won't fire, your glow plugs won't work. You, you know, you can have a problem with that. So I would definitely look into that. It's a maintenance item if you haven't done it, just, just to be done. Um, then the other thing is that high-pressure oil pump, they, they fail too. You can pull the plug out of the side of it and see if it's full of oil. Is when you crank it, you know, go to YouTube and say, uh, type in checking high pressure, high pop oil level uh, on that 7.3, and it'll it'll show 
where it's supposed to be at. Cause some of them just have a long crank time. They have to crank, 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 crank till the oil gets up high enough, builds up pressure, opens the injectors. If that thing is bleeding down or it's failed, it's, it's going to say it has pressure, but it really doesn't have pressure. Um, because it's, it's commanding that pressure, but it's not actually where it's supposed to be because you've got a, a problem with it bleeding down. So I would, I would start my next two things because you got to keep it in small chunks here, bite it off a little bit at a time. You know, I would look at those valve covers and see if that, you can even just unplug one and see if it's starting to melt inside of the terminal and then uh, get that repaired. And then uh, look at that high pressure oil pump. A couple things to look at at home that you can do. A lot of diagnosis on diesels that can be drive you nuts. Yes, sir. It's about, I'm about nuts now. <laughs> I he can tell. He oh. sounds amazingly calm. <laughs> yeah. let, let me ask you one question. Now, you say it's some plugs that hook up in that head. Yes. Is it on both sides yes. or is it just one? Each valve cover has a plug-in connector that plugs into the valve okay. cover gaskets and it transfers the current from the outside connector to the inside connector and they can melt right in there they can go bad they actually sell a little harness that's about six inches long or so that you crimp all the wires on or solder them on with heat shrink on the engine you know outside of the valve cover side before you put this thing together because they had so many problems with them okay what color but is I, your truck johnny it's harvest gold okay I mean, I've now oh. I'm picturing this thing. I'm invested in this truck now. I'm, I really want it just to fire up and run for yeah, him. Yeah, he, absolutely. He's, does that uh, help? That, you? I was intending to say to you, oh, I changed the oil in that truck. Mm-hmm. Well, before I changed the oil, I put the IPR in it. And uh, so when I changed the oil, I guess in that high pressure oil pump, when I pull the IPR, it you know how that oil come out, right? Yep. So when I change the oil, I open the plug on the top of it to see the you know the height of the oil, right? Because I looked on YouTube, like you said, and it said it shouldn't be no more than an inch from the top. So I fill it back up to that point, but it's still you know like I say, it won't start. But now I got somewhere else to go but mm-hmm. before i do that and i'm gonna let you go because i know you have other people but uh <laughs> i'm going to put that it's been raining the weather been bad here that's why i just really hadn't been just so 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 working on it. but i'm going to put that all water separator back on it because i did put that sending unit in the tank in the reed switch and all that was bad the boot had fell off you know, right. So I'm going to put that oil filter back on there, that oil water separator uh, filter that I'm telling you about. Good idea. And then I'm going to see what kind of fuel pressure I'm getting up to the bowl. Sounds good. Yeah, you're on the right track. But yeah. I was wishing one of the earlier things would have solved this. When he called, For I was sure. hoping he was going to give us a success story. Right. Of, it's already running, but mm-hmm. but in this case, he's still not running. Johnny, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. Quick question. We got about a minute here. Uh, maybe you can answer this. It's on the chat. Would love to hear about how to set up electronic brake controller gain settings on a truck for a trailer. How do I determine the best gain number for my 6,000 pound horse trailer? Luck. <laughs> Trial and error. Yeah. Little at a time. Yep. No, okay. there's no, there's no 100% because all trailers, a lot of trailers are different. I just say all trailers are different because most of them are different. The brakes are going <laughs> to be worn different. Uh, the weights are going to be different. So every time I put a trailer on my truck, I change it. I change the number. I just realized that I have a flat spot on one of my tires from having the gain set too high when I was originally playing with mine on my trailer. So start low. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I squealed them to, to break because okay. I had it set so high. Just, I was doing a manual adjustment and I, I just realized how to, I flat spot on my tire. I noticed when I was looking at one the other day. So definitely start low and work your way up. So it's something that you 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 kind of want to say, all right, I'm going to give myself some time today to go do this. Just drive and, around a little bit and see, yeah. how it, see how it feels and see how you can notice when the trailer is starting to do its own work back there and mm-hmm. just, just find a happy medium there. All right. Are you guys, uh, we have kind of an abbreviated 
after show today. We got stuff to do. We're busy. We're busy guys. I mean, I got, I don't know what you guys have going, but I. You've had three weeks to rest. What do you mean? Why are you busy? I got a couple paint by numbers I got to finish. I've uh, got that crossword. Folded all the clothes. Any whittling? Because I go downstairs when I was sick. I would go downstairs. I'd fold some clothes. And then I would think. Oh, I can't, I can't go. I I can't go back upstairs. It's going to be a while. So I would, <laughs> <laughs> I would just sit on the couch and look around the basement going, what can I do while I'm down here? I wish I would have. Too tired to fold clothes. <laughs> I'm going to lay on them now. <laughs> yeah. I got no phone, no nothing. I really should have thought this basement thing. This is terrible. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go to the phones. All yeah. right. Let's go. We're going to go to Oregon and talk to Nick. You're on the under the hood show. Nick, what can we do for you? Yeah, how you guys doing? Fantastic, Nick. I'm uh, pretty new to the program, but uh, I've listened to it when I can. And I'm very impressed. Thank you. With it. Um, yeah, so I've got a, um, I've got a, the fourth owner. I've got a used truck, the 2013 F-150, three and a half liter, the V6 boost motor, and. Uh, Got a hundred and twenty-three thousand, hundred and twenty-two thousand five hundred miles on it. Um, it's making this like intermittent rattle noise when you start it after it's been sitting for a long time. I'd say probably like eight hours minimum. Seems like. Um, I had it diagnosed at a local dealer here. They had it for three or four days. And uh, they were not able to replicate the rattle sound at all, which I thought was surprising. Um, what else? Um, yeah, so I'm, basically they gave me a, um, they gave me an estimate on what they think it is. Um, I have not really noticed any heavy oil leaks. They say that there is. Um, and gave me an estimate for basically replacing the whole uh, timing components of this engine. And so that's kind of where I'm at, of whether or not I should have it done, get rid of it. Um, kind of wanted to get your... In, in all, uh, my, I'm, on, curious how, I'm curious how much their estimate was. It was, now it's $4,500. Yeah, so you can, if you're somewhat mechanically inclined, I mean, if you've you've taken apart engines before and things, there's not a lot of detail work involved with resealing the front of that engine. A lot of it is just labor, physical labor to take stuff apart. You don't have to take the timing chains off, but you can put a new tensioner in without taking the chains off on the front of the motor. First of all, <laughs> Excuse me. I think Russ and I are thinking for the, the same, leaks. I think the same thing. We think that noise is a tensioner that's bleeding down as it sits, mm-hmm. loses pressure, and then it's noisy when it starts until it gets the pressure back on the tensioner because that tensioner's probably lost a seal and is bleeding out yep. or something. And sometimes the reason they probably couldn't have found it is because you have to start the engine, run it until it's completely warm, and then <laughs> shut it off, let it sit, and start it. If oh, they sure. just if they just fire it up and go up oh, nothing and then turn it off and fire it up they're probably not going to find it little tricks we learn about how to try to force an engine to make a noise that we're not just going to hear normally but and you know if they if you've got leaks up there then that's one thing you can you could do you could fix the leaks and then throw a tensioner in it and then eliminate one of your problems and get rid of the leaks as well at the same time um that it's it's not near as near as hard as you think, but it can be a little you know make you apprehensive. Going boy, there's a lot of stuff. But if you watch the YouTube videos, you'll see it, and the cost of the parts uh, can get up there. You know when they're at a dealership, when they're telling you what you need, you nickel and dime in all those parts. But we get our parts from AutoZone, and there are some kits available for these where you can get. Um, you know, a tensioner. You can get gasket kits. You can get all these things together, and it's it's makes it more cost effective that way and still repairs everything just like the OEM parts would. And you can stop your leaks. The other thing we hear in those engines that makes a little bit of rattle on startup sometimes is the turbos. Uh, And 
when those turbos are are failing, you, it's the wastegate that starts to rattle. But that's not something to really be super concerned about right away. I know that sound. Yeah, the gears did it, Chris. Mm-hmm. But they can do it for a long time. Or if you're like Chris, it could do it for a week, but not on that EcoBoost. They, <laughs> we see those go a lot longer. We have a couple customers that have been driving for three or four years with that rattle, and they just leave it. But as far as the timing tensioner goes, I would not wait on that. I would get that done sooner than later. but And the trucks, they hold their value still. We're still putting new, brand new engines in these trucks, 5.4s and the EcoBoost. Uh, we just did an 11 the other day, and it was like $12,000 for a remanufactured EcoBoost engine installed with new turbos and everything. And they were glad to do it because that's a truck that to replace it was going to be, you know, $16,000, $17,000. So they just made 4000 bucks by fixing what they had, plus they got a truck with a three or 100,000-mile warranty. So if you can fix your EcoBoost for, let's say you just go crazy and say, I'm just going to let the dealer put all that in and it's 4000 bucks, it's still a lot less than what the truck would cost to replace, and it's the value's there. But I think you can save a lot more if you do some of the stuff yourself if you think you can, but some people don't want to or their time involved and. A lot of times I don't want to fix my own stuff. I get super tired. I work all day. I just want to be done with it. Does that help you out there, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the second part of my question would be, with the, this is the first generation of this uh, truck, right? The 2013? Yeah, pretty much for uh, that EcoBoost, yeah. Because I know that my um, my neighbor... Uh, he has a 2017 and he bought it with 50,000 miles on it and he had the full cam phaser replacement done and it was covered by Ford under a, I think it was a recall. Is there a, it, a year restriction on that? Oh yeah. That you guys are aware of? Yeah. And yeah. that's, that was only on the five, four V8 is what he had, right? Or not the five. <sighs> yeah. The, uh. 302 5.0 coyote i think yeah 302 50 yeah they had some but, but you're thinking it was an eco, his was an eco boost yeah I think okay. okay well there could be something we're yeah. not aware of there and they're they're very limited so they're there's sometimes where they'll say so they didn't do a, a blanket recall on a lot of stuff but they have had some where if the truck was still under warranty or they bumped up the warranty and said five year fifty thousand ten year hundred we're gonna cover this engine in this year truck because we know that when we put it together we had some faulty parts that came from the or even a certain VIN supplier. range sometimes yep. they came from the supplier and they they were known as bad so they they covered it but yeah but they definitely don't cover all of them you know we've seen a, a number of them we usually check when a truck comes in or a car we look and see what recalls are and bulletins just to see if there's something that might help us out fix it and there's been a number of times where we said hey you Take this thing to the dealer and you you give them this piece of paper because this should be free. And sometimes they'll go to the dealer and they'll come back and say, I'm so glad that you tried to help me with that, but they said no. So I'm back to have you pay you to do it. Yeah. Does that right. help you out there, Nick? Yeah. yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much for the call. Good luck. All right, I think that'll uh, probably do it for the after show. Yeah, and he was, his, he, was right the mo- he was right in the money. The different generations of truck, they... You know, the, f- yeah. the 15 and newer, I think it was, is all the aluminum truck, new design, everything. And then he had the one that, I think the, I think it was the 10 or 11 they started at EcoBoost. Um, oh, the 11. Yeah. Yeah. And then they had that generation there, so totally different animals. Yeah, we, we had our joy with that first 11 yes. that we went through and through oh and through gosh. and through. That was like in 14 is when we did that. It was just, a f- just barely out of warranty. That was a long time it ago. It was. That was back in 2014 we were messing with that. Hmm. Ten years ago. Can wow. you believe it already? I'm still Facebook friends with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must have done an okay job. Well, we got something figured yeah. out. <laughs> All, right, All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, watching. If you're still with us, if you're, I guess if you're not, I, I'm, then I you're not have, watching. I don't have to say anything. Yeah. I don't have to go on the air and tell everybody we're off the air. They know, right? Yeah. All right. There you go. Thanks for watching the Under the Hood Show. Make sure you like. And this is no joke. Like, subscribe, and uh, click on, yeah. Yeah, and double, if you have like uh, subscribed before, please check and see if you still sure you are, still because have. a lot of, 
And you don't have to turn the notification on that'll come up because I'm subscribed to, I bet I'm subscribed to a hundred channels because I want to go back there later if I need to. Yeah, but that- I turn the notification off because I don't necessarily, I mean, I know when under the hood's on, right? If you want to watch our show, you're going to come watch it. You notice gonna- I never say ring the bell. Yeah, because I don't like it when I keep getting these, like, you yeah. know, I'm looking at my phone now. I got a whole bunch of notifications and I don't want to see. Oh, and this happened. This happened. Notifications. This happened. No, <laughs> I'll go to the channel and I'll watch mm-hmm. it. Hopefully, you know, if their channel is good enough, I'm going to go check yeah. it out. All right. There you go. That is the Under the Hood Show. Thanks, everybody.